I just want to thank everyone for joining us today for the 2022 Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series. Um, our series is hosted by the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens in partnership with the City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, um, Jefferson County Commission Office, Leeds, Alabama, the Stormwater Management Authority, Alabama Green Industry, Alabama Cooperative Extension, and Jefferson County Department of Health. And today here um, we have Hanna with Jefferson County Commission here to introduce Olivia Fuller with Alabama Cooperative Extension, um, who is leading our session today called Herb Appeal. Good morning, everybody. We are really excited uh, today to have Olivia Fuller. It's pretty impressive. I was reading her bio and I was like, oh my gosh, no wonder why we invited her. I haven't met her in person, but I good to see her today. So Olivia, she is a regional extension agent for the commercial horticulture at Alabama Cooperative Extension System through Auburn University. She covers 10 counties in the west central region of Alabama. She recently lived in the Big Apple, New York City, where she worked for the world's largest rooftop farm, Brooklyn Grange. She harvested crops for food relief programs that help those in need. She also uh, worked with Michelin star restaurants. While she was in New York, Olivia joined the Northeast Organic Farming Association and attended conferences about organic horticulture. Upon moving back to Alabama, she started working for Auburn University's Extension System, where she is housed in the Birmingham Botanical Garden. She lives nearby and owns a local apiary. She graduated from university with an agriculture economics degree while doing stormwater research, there we go, for the horticultural department and just enrolled in her master's program there. Growing vegetables instilled a love of providing food for those without access, with, sorry, without access to healthy produce. She now has the opportunity to share that passion and knowledge with growers in the Black Belt region, as well as urban beekeepers and farmers. Thank you for that introduction. That was, <laughs> I hope I can live up to that. Um, thank you for having me, everybody. This is really fun. Um, we're going to be doing it kind of old school way. I'll have to say next slide, please, because I am traveling. I'm in Auburn actually doing a podcast for, I'm on the commercial horticulture team and we're doing a podcast for farmers in the field has kind of been the, audience that we've tried to keep in mind for that podcast. Um, we've got about 10 episodes recorded now. We've been recording all morning, which I'm in the studio and my computer is propped up on a ladder in front of me. So <laughs> hopefully it doesn't fall in the midst of this, but um, sorry for the bit of chaos of what's going on in my life right now, but hopefully I can get some knowledge across about herbs because they're some of my favorite things. Uh, anytime somebody calls me about wanting to, because I'm all about urban gardening. I, that kind of is what instilled my love of horticulture was the New York City experience and realizing how much you can grow in such a small space. That was really eye-opening to me coming from Alabama where everybody's got all the land and they can just you know, not have to worry about space, but when you're really utilizing what you have, it's pretty impressive of what can be grown in that space. So herbs are some of the um, more fun ways to utilize that because it's kind of the closest thing to instant gratification in the garden. In my opinion, they're really easy. Um, you can harvest it and see results of your garden almost right away. Things that can be utilized in just about every mill, every cocktail, every um, herbal tea. You know, it's, it's pretty fun because you can quickly use things from the garden and just about everything you're doing in the kitchen with just like a little kitchen garden, something in your windowsill. Um, just, and then there's the medicinal purposes of them. Um, just so many fun things surrounding herbs. So what are herbs? You know, you hear this word, um, sometimes it's confused with spices 
And so to differentiate the two, um, herbs is, it's all about like what part of the plant they come from. So herbs are the green leafy parts of the plant, which are used for seasoning and flavoring food, sometimes in teas, as I mentioned. And they're distinguished from vegetables and spices because they're used in small amounts to provide flavor rather than substance. Um, and they're typically used fresh um, and then for certain purposes as such, and then dried for other purposes like teas and things. So that's a little bit about how to know what an herb is. So next slide, please. When you're wanting to do this, um, it can look many different ways. There's lots of planning that should go into any garden. Anytime you set out to do a new project, there should be lots of planning so that you're set up for success. Uh, starting small, you know, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself so that you're disappointed. You want to stay encouraged and see rewards instead of, you know, quantity over quality or quality over quantity. And that way you're set up for success. And by planning, that's what you're doing. You're understanding the water source. And, you know, if you're doing something large, you want to make sure that you can water it appropriately. Uh, light is super important. Herbs usually need a lot of sunlight. Um, I think typically at least six hours of full sun is a good standard rule of thumb to follow for most herbs. Uh, basil and some of the more summery herbs that you associate with that. Uh, spacing, that's so important. I talk about space a lot because I usually don't have farmers call me unless there's a disease or you know, a fungus or insect problem. And it's usually because they didn't space appropriately. Um, spacing provides, uh, when done correctly, that airflow to go between the plants and have the sun shine and hit all of the leaves that prevents fungus as well. Um, it gets pollination if it need be, which is usually not the case for herbs, but you know, if we're talking about tomatoes and things, um, if there's too much in one area, you're not going to get enough bees. And the wind is usually a big pollinator too. So if the wind can't flow through all of the little branches and limbs and so forth, it's not going to get that. Um, thinking of soil, thinking of drainage, so many herbs need proper drainage. Like I said, it's usually a fell proof plant, but it's when keeping these things in mind, you know, lots of sun, proper drainage. Most herbs need a little bit more on the dry side of soil. If you're going to have one or the other, you know, it's, they usually would handle dry, more dry soils and climates a little bit better. And then accessibility. If you can't get in to pick the plants that you've planted and utilize them, it's not going to be as rewarding. You're not going to have as much fun doing that. If you're struggling to go out and get them, it's like, oh, I'll just use what's in the pantry and, you know, what's out of sight, out of mind. So you, you also won't tend to take care of it if it's not close by. So keep those things in mind as you're kind of visualizing right now. You know, you've, you've joined this clearly because you want to grow herbs. So, you know, as you're picturing these things of where you're going to put them, just kind of keep these things in mind. Um, and here's a nice little design layout there to my right and kind of shows some fun things you can do and ways you can section things off. Um, one of the things that is in this diagram is Asian herbs. And that's some of the more fun and exciting varieties that I've discovered lately has been, and they, they grow really well here because there's a lot of areas in Asia that have similar climate zones as we have here in the Southeast. So 
just because you're not seeing those herbs grown here doesn't mean they can't be grown here. They seem to do really well. There's a lot of things we grew in New York City on the rooftop because, you know, we had to make, get the most bang for our buck with the space we had. And we could sell herbs for a lot and they took up very little space. So that was um, a big part of how we brought in income was selling these herbs to like the Michelin star restaurants. Um, and then we drew, uh, grew different varieties. So we did in one of the rooftop locations we had was in a uh, Asian community. So we grew the Asian varieties for them so they would recognize and know how to utilize them and cook them. And just, you know, feel more comfortable coming to our farm. It was things that they recognized. So that was really fun to discover some of those herbs that you typically only find at Asian produce stores like in Birmingham and it's you know sometimes hard to come by um, and one is called shiso and that's been a fun one because it's grown it's kind of a weed here in America but it tastes kind of funky but if you like it then you're probably going to love it because I do but some people are put off by that strong scent that it has and it is a unique kind of uh, mint like flavor when you incorporate it into foods but it's funny because I'll see it I'll see people spraying it on my farm like some of the farms I go to they're spraying it and trying to kill it I'm like just you can eat that <laughs> so that's kind of fun to discover things that are in fact edible okay we can go to the next slide so as I mentioned, planning, so important. How much time do you have? You don't wanna get in over your head. Um, do you want a large formal bed, something that just looks really nice, but is also edible? I've been working with Auburn. Uh, there's a new culinary science building here and I've been working with them. They have a rooftop garden there. It's the first one in Alabama. So I'm pretty excited about being in on that project because it's, it's pretty cool and it intrigues a lot of people. It gets a lot of people involved in farming and in horticulture. So that's, I think, a fun little uh, easy way in for some people to see that are, especially in urban areas. But uh, you can do all types of things and just utilizing the space that you have and still making it pretty if you want to. That's kind of what we've worked with, with the rooftop uh, finding uh, edible flowers, you know, things that still look really nice and can be used for decorative purposes, but also edible. So I think that's like a win-win that I try and keep in mind when I'm helping people plan their herb gardens. Uh, and you can do an informal one if you really just want something to cook with to save money at the grocery store, because I mean, it is a the best bang for your buck. The herbs in grocery stores are so expensive for a tiny little bundle. And you could just easily grow that. You could buy the whole plant for the price of a few twigs that you're getting at the grocery store and then plant and have, you know, year round supply. So you can do those in containers as well. Um, that's been a great thing that I've seen people utilize in all kinds of ways. I mean, if you look up on Pinterest, different container gardens, you'll get all of the ideas. You'll have projects planned to keep you busy for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's, it's pretty fun to see that. So we can go to the next slide. And then press it again, please. And I have some pictures of, and you can keep pressing. I think there's a couple of pictures that should move in. Um, so this is what some formal beds look like. And you know it can look really nice and still be edible, still be something that you are cooking with. Uh, so I think that's really fun to see a lot of my growers look at their landscape differently, especially I've been working on a big pollinator program, teaching people to kind of see their yard differently, um, put in flowering plants instead of useless, useless shrubs, because those aren't really helping anyone. And then, you know, when you think of herbs or things that flower, things that flower and are edible for human consumption, like that's just such an easy way to incorporate uh, things that serve multiple purposes. I think that's what we're all about when we're looking at our yard, especially if it's smaller, you wanna make the most of it. 
And then we can look at some informal ones on the next slide. Sorry for having to do this. Um, <laughs> the screen sharing capabilities on my end here in the studio was not great. So thank you, Hannah, for helping. Um, and here's some informal ones, you know, small, just kind of thrown out there. Still looks great though, you know, so there's lots of different ways to do this. All right, we can go to the next, please. So as I said, accessibility, you want it close, near the kitchen, in the kitchen window even, especially when I was in New York, a lot of people utilized their little fire escapes and their balconies, including me, and had things that would grow there because they loved the sun usually. So it was a great location for that because you're cooking and you're like, oh, let me just throw in a twig of this. And it just is so satisfying to be able to eat things that you've grown. And then it saves money. You know, when people are wanting to get into gardening, I always tell them like, let's start here. You know, that way you have that instant gratification. So we can go to the next slide, please. So where to plant? Um, consider the plant's origin. You know, as I said, some of the herbs from Asia do really well, depending on which part of Asia they're grown in, of course, but typically in full sun, six to eight hours. And like I said, uh, properly drained soil is so important. And here in Alabama, we have a lot of clay, especially in the West Central set where I work. Um, most everybody has that heavy clay soil. So, but the important thing is to not add sand because that makes concrete. <laughs> so, you know, when you're trying to amend the soil that you have, um, work with compost and peat and other organic materials that are going to break down and loosen that soil up a little bit, but sand is not the way to go. Cannot stress that enough. So uh, next slide, please. Can we do, okay, perfect. <laughs> um, and spacing. As I mentioned, the airflow needs to go in. There needs to be light. This is important for anything. So, you know, I might be talking about herbs right now, but, you know, insert tomato plants, insert peppers, you know, you can, all of this information is across the board for a lot of garden plants. Um, anything that's tightly planted, the foliage is going to stay so damp that it, bacteria and diseases, I mean, we're in Alabama, there's so many, I, on my podcast earlier today, I had the plant pathologist here in Auburn come in and talk about it. And he's just, he had transferred from Illinois and he's just like, it's great down here. I'm busy all the time. I've got so much to see. And I mean, he's loving it, but <laughs> the farmers are not because there's a lot of disease as humid as our climate is here. So trying to mitigate that as much as you can. And so these are some tips on how to um, we can go to the next slide. I think that's all of that. Oh, and I see your question a little bit um, asking about if those are containers sunk into the ground, and they are, yes. So just to quickly answer that one. Um, and so the soil. Uh, when somebody calls me a big part of my job, I feel like it's just telling people to test your soil. It is so important. Um, it will save you so much time so much money, know what you're working with, and that way you can plant things that make sense there. Sometimes I have people call and say, I want to do blueberries, and they have a pH of like almost eight, and that's just not going to work. They're going to be fighting against mother nature all the time, and you know, it's better to just embrace what you have, embrace the land that was given to you, and grow things that make sense there. So herbs do prefer a soil pH of six to seven. And that's pretty common. Most things do like that range. Um, so it's just about getting your pH to that level. That's one of the most important things when you're reading a soil test to pay attention to is what the pH, what pH you have. So you can fix that first and then work your way down to the other things. Um, incorporate the organic material and lime if you need to, uh, to bring that pH down. 
um, it helps break up that soil, especially when our, we have such clay soil here. Remove the rocks, weeds, start, you know, start ahead of the game. And that way you're not fighting the weeds year round. And, you know, if you have so many weeds and you're trying to prioritize, you're just overwhelmed, pull the ones that are about to flower and go to seed. Those are the most important because that one weed is about to be 20 weeds. So get those first and work your way down. And that way you're not too overwhelmed with weeding and getting discouraged. All right, next slide, please. So Alabama, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, it is kind of hard here, but we do have a super long growing season. So, you know, take some and give some. So we've got really high heat, really high humidity, and then the clay soils I mentioned, but that can work in our favor. Um, choosing varieties, choosing types of herbs that do well in that high heat is great because a lot do. Like I said, herbs do love hot weather typically. Um, but if you need to and you have some herbs that don't like hot weather, do things like uh, a bed that's shaded for part of the day. So it gets full sun for a few hours, but then the sun moves behind a tree a little bit. So that's a great way to mitigate. So just looking at your yard, looking at it for a few days, seeing the way the sun moves across it, and you can plant accordingly once you kind of understand the lay of your land. All right, next slide. Um, yeah, and I was going to mention one of my, one of the funnier herbs to me is cilantro because you think of it in your tacos midsummer and it's such a refreshing herb and it's always associated with summer, but it's actually grown in the winter. So they really, cilantro really does love a cooler climate. So think of planting that in the fall. Um, definitely not something to put out in the heat of summer. So that can be something maybe you dry and you, you know store properly, dehydrate it, dry it, put it in an uh, airtight container and use it next summer because it's not going to be something in the heat of summer that you go out and pick and put on top of your tacos because it just won't be there. Uh, same thing with dill and parsley, which I think it's funny because we do seem to associate these with summer, but that's not actually when they do well. All right, so next slide. Um, fertilizing, they really don't need much. So it's a great starter thing to grow. Um, I usually see herbs that are overwatered and over fertilized versus under. Um, it'll cause too much green and the you lose the flavor. You lose that good aroma and Usually when plants are stressed, they uh, become sweeter, become more flavorful. So it's kind of funny because sometimes that peach that has a bruise is going to be the sweeter peach. Uh, I try and you know, keep people away from that mindset of perfect food because you're usually losing a lot of the flavor when it's perfect and looks great. It's, it's usually missing some of that um, flavor and uh, things that just, you know, make it desirable just because of the way it works. Like if a peach is bruised, it sends out chemicals to heal itself. And those chemicals are usually sugary type things. So that's the reason why. Um, using a slow release, that way you're not bombarding your plant with so much at once. And then it sprouts out everywhere and loses that flavor. So slow release fertilizers are great. They break down slowly. All right, next. And direct seeding. That's usually the way to go when you're talking about herbs. Um, there are certain things that do need to be transplanted to get that head start in the season and to sometimes usually beat the diseases and beat some of the pests that come through. That way it's already very well established before those dreaded army worms start marching into town. That way it's, you know, sturdy and can be handled being sprayed and handle a little bit of damage if that happens. But when it comes to herbs, direct seeding is usually the way to go. Um, it allows the roots to get really established, which is important for them. Sometimes sowing, especially now March is fine. 
but March, April is usually your window to get some of those good summer herbs. And just cover with a light sprinkling of soil. They do not need to be deep. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that you can just really throw out and kind of rake the ground back over a little bit and then just water it after you do, or just wait until there's gonna be rain in the forecast. You know, I'm all about working with mother nature and not against. If you see it's gonna rain, go out the day before, sprinkle them into the ground, rake it over, and then your seedlings will soon start to germinate and then you can thin out, which is always so hard to do. I hate doing that part because all of your sweet little seeds, but it's so important because if you avoid that step, you're not going to get the results you want. Um, so just think of, you're actually saving your plants by killing them. <laughs> so you really do want to thin them out. All right, next slide. Uh, reseeding. So dill, cilantro, parsley, fennel, and anise are readily reseeded each year. So I kind of broke some of the more common herbs down into some good little fat sheets. So these are the things that are reseeded. And next slide. And then transplanting. So I did mention that some things can be transplanted, uh, especially if you started a little kitchen container garden on your windowsill, but indoors during the winter, you can move those outdoors as soon as March, April arrives. So right now, um, they should not be deeper than container. You need to make sure they do drain really well. Some of these uh, windowsill things I see don't have drainage holes in the bottom. So drilling those in is very important because the soil will get so damp, especially being outside, that your herbs, they may look great, but the roots are probably rotting. So make sure you drill in those drainage holes. And then water. Um, sometimes I've seen people plant them under a little bit of a slope of the house and they're not actually, the water's going just inches away from them. So that's the case. You will have to go out and hand water those if, if that's what you're doing. All right, next slide. So propagation. There's a lot of ways to, you know, if you're wanting to get into herbs to save money. And if you've bought some at the store, you can sometimes do root cuttings. And so that's great for horseradish and ginger. Um, stem cutting, so rosemary, thyme, oregano, uh, lemon verbena, and French tarragon. Those are great for using the stem cuttings to propagate. And then dividing. So mint, of course, is great. You can just take a little bit of it and accidentally drop some and you're going to have mint taking over. But so on that note, when it comes to things like mint and even oregano, some, make sure you keep it contained. Make sure that it can't keep crawling and taking over all of your other plants. Those are, mint is a great container garden plant because it really does need to be contained. <laughs> it will take over quickly. Um, and it goes for all varieties of mint, anything in the mint family, which there is a lot of. I had no idea so many things were considered mint. Um, and they all taste so different, really. So that's kind of fun and exciting to play around with. Um, all right, next slide, please. So purchasing. Uh, if you're going to the store, you're all excited. You want to have that herb garden you know, look for good sturdy stalks on the plants. Make sure you look at the roots and if they're in those little things that you can easily pop out, pop those out and look at the root system, make sure that there's not any diseases already there. Uh, check the leaves underneath, look under for aphids and there's a lot of plant cells going on right now. And most people do a great job of most of the nurseries and um, the botanical gardens and most people do a great job of keeping their plants very healthy. So when they're selling them, you're taking home the best plant possible, but it's always good to check and you know, know what you're buying. That way you don't infect your other plants at home. And remember, the best plant is not the largest. Sometimes the largest is not so great because it's not been pruned back. It's not been pinched back. Whatever the case may be, look for the ones that are sturdy and have a good root system and have a good stalk on them because 
those will end up doing the best in the long run. Okay, next slide. So containers, as I mentioned, that can be, some of this is a little repetitive on this, but mint, as, mint and oregano, um, and they can handle a little bit more high pH levels. So in West Central Alabama, the pH is usually pretty high. So those are some of the varieties I direct people for. Uh, and convenient location. So just make sure you have proper drainage on those containers. It's a big thing I would recommend. All right, next slide. And the life expectancy. So the annual herbs, they you know look great for one year and harvest all of that to the end of the year. So that's where you want to make sure you know, maybe you have a dehydrator on hand and, or if you just hang them up, you know, if winter is almost there, you can hang them up in front of the fireplace and let them just dry over time, but make sure that they're dried properly so they don't get moldy once you put them in containers um, in your pantry. So things for that are dill, parsley, basil, and cilantro. Those are your annual herbs. Um, and those would be things that you can utilize still year round, but usually just fresh for that one season and then store them and use them in teas. Um, I, I love herbal teas so much. I drink tea year round constantly and I'm very sensitive to caffeine. So I tried to do herbal tea after lunchtime. And you know, I feel healthy because you, you can choose all kinds that have medicinal purposes. And it's, you know, some of them may or may not be what they say they do, but it's still, you know, I think better than water. So it's got some things going for it, but those are great to utilize some of your excess herbs for. And I, I usually use a French press for mine. I have a, you know, it's a small little one and you put the leaves in, pour the boiling water in and then plunge it down so that you get the flavor, but not the leaves. So that's a fun way I like to make my herbal tea. Uh, and then, so perennials, they thrive for years. They'll, especially rosemary, I mean, y'all know, you'll see it kind of get pretty huge and start taking over, same with thyme. Um, and those are great for when we were talking about those formal gardens, things that are going to last longer and can kind of also add a touch to the garden that's pretty and fragrant as well. All right, next slide. And culinary herbs. So we've talked a lot. Most of the things I've mentioned are culinary herbs. And there's some really fun ones, though. I encourage you all to Google and find some new and exciting things that other cultures use in their foods. Um, because a lot of the times my supervisor uh, or my team leader is here at Auburn and he grows a lot of Indian varieties. And it's so fun to see and he'll let us have some to try because they do really well, which we're in Auburn here, but very similar climates in Birmingham. And it's really fun to see that a lot of those herbs that are typically grown in India do really well here. So I encourage you to explore these different types of things that you might not have tried before. I discovered a lot of things in New York that we were utilizing, a lot of the restaurants were requesting. So there's lots of fun things, you know, beyond the ones you see at the grocery store. So, and you have that freedom when you're growing your own to, you know, explore those new flavors that you might not be able to find at Publix. So I think that's a big reason, a big reason I grow herbs. One, I'm traveling a lot for work. And so my poor house, if people drove by it, I'm thinking, oh no, they'll never guess I'm in horticulture because it sometimes looks terrible, but herbs, a great way to keep it looking alive and vibrant and I can grow those things that I'm not able to buy locally. All right next slide. Um, oregano as I mentioned it's a perennial uh, so and again one that should be used in a container uh, great for tomato based sauces and soups and keep pinching off the flour so that one it'll taste funky when the flowers start most same goes with basil. Um, you want to keep the keep it from flowering because and going to seed because it loses its flavor at that point. All right, next slide. Parsley, uh, biennial, 
great for landscape and you can get all kinds of different types of parsley. Um, it's been bred with other herbs now too. So it, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's, there's a few things that it's been bred with that's pretty fun to cook with because it's, you know, another new and unique flavor. So, and there's lots of uses for these. And again, like you can just Google recipes that utilize, you know, insert herb that you have and you'll get all kinds of good stuff. Next slide, please. And French tarragon, as I mentioned earlier, it's great for salads and vinegars. And I just think it's so fun to, not only do I like to teach people how to grow food, I like to teach them how to cook the food that they're growing because if not, it's useless. And that's what keeps people interested in horticulture. Um, that's why I think it's, I'm so excited about the culinary science building coming in here at Auburn because it's going to be everything in one building that's grown, it's harvested, it's cooked and it's eaten all in one building. I think that that's a missing component that agriculture has, you know, it's so rare that people know where their food comes from and getting interested in cooking, you, you usually are eating healthier. And I just, I see a lot of excitement in that world right now. And I think it's fun to get involved in and grow things that you like to cook with and eat and learn new ways to do it. So um, there's a, and Texas tarragon is a good substitute for French tarragon and that seems to grow better here. So if you're looking for varieties, as I said, don't fight against mother nature, grow varieties that do well in Alabama. Um, all right, next slide. And thyme, so great for borders. This is one of those that I love to tell people to plant if they just want things to look pretty because you know, if they have the wild hair and want to go out and eat some things out of their yard, but that's not their main goal, this is still great to plant there because they can use it when they're cooking poultry and fish, fish type mills. Um, and it does have a slight minty flavor and there's all kinds of varieties of thyme. If you go to, there's a lot of great nurseries in Birmingham that I love to support and they're locally owned and they usually have tons of varieties of each of these common herbs I'm mentioning. So then they're not terribly common and you're not bored of them because it's, you know, a different take on it and you can use it differently. And this one does great dried as well. I wanted to mention that. All right, next slide. Fennel, fennel has been a fun one for me. I've, I used to not eat it or really know how to, so I just never bought it or utilized it, but I've been cooking with it a lot lately because I've, it's been on sale at the grocery store. So <laughs> I haven't actually grown my own yet, but I do see a lot of growers utilizing this because it's a perennial. So it's easier. You just plant it and, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, replanting it constantly, but you can utilize the bulb, you can utilize the foliage. Um, there's just lots of cool uses for this. And I encourage you to look up some of the uses because I was surprised. Now I'm using it in a lot of my food. So that's been a fun one that I, it's always been around, but I'm just now starting to eat it. All right, next slide. And then sage, it's a perennial. It's really easy to grow great for stuffings, um, but there's also more fun uses than what I have here. So, you know, I do encourage y'all to look into some of these that you're intrigued by and find some unique uses for them to just keep things fun for you. Um, and it does have some great flowers. It's a great one to grow for, especially certain type things in the sage family. Some of them are really great for pollinators too, so. Again, multi-uses for some of these things. Next slide. Basil, this is one of my favorites. Um, and you can get so many different types of basil now. It's unbelievable. I've seen chocolate basil. I've seen all kinds of different takes on it. So that's been exciting. Um, main ingredient in pesto, and who doesn't love pesto? So that's a fun one to grow because you can add it in last minute when you're cooking and it changes the whole dish. You, you know, you seem like such a chef when you 
throw in some fresh herbs. It really changes a meal. It, it makes it really great. I think um, it's a great way to have like instant gratification when you're cooking a meal for someone and you're like, oh, this tastes really good. And you're like, oh, well, I grew the herbs. And you know, it's just such a fun thing to do. Next slide. And there's rosemary. Um, uh, it smells amazing. I love just having that planted by my front porch because when I'm sitting out there, I can smell it constantly. And it, it's usually pretty because it's an evergreen shrub. So it's usually pretty strong year round. Um, so it does uh, love sunny locations though. But I think that's a great one to have nearby anywhere that you're going to be sitting often. And I think I've heard it keeps some of the mosquitoes too. I think it's great for keeping no seums and mosquitoes away from you if you are on your porch. All right, next slide. Oh, next slide, please. I think it was just an added picture. All right, so chives, another great one, often overlooked. It's in the onion family. Um, you can harvest the stalk and utilize like the whole thing. So. It's a really fun one that I love chopping up and putting in some of my dishes. Next slide. Uh, cilantro, as I mentioned, it's not great to plant in the summer. <laughs> so uh, grow from seed though. This is an important one that you, you don't wanna transplant. Um, sowing every few weeks will give you a steady supply. I love succession planting because it keeps you, you know, ample, fruits and vegetables, and you don't have a whole lot at once that you don't know what to do with. So planting a little bit over the course of the season is great. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. I feel like I'm running out of time. Oh, well, that was the end of it. Okay, I knew I was getting close, but I wanted to leave time for questions and to go through the Q&A box. I think some have been coming in, but thank you all so much. And again, I'm Olivia Fuller. And y'all can email me at OCF000, so three zeros and a two at the end, 0002 at auburn.edu. And I can post that in the chat later, but feel free to reach out with any following questions I don't get to today. And thank y'all for listening to me for an hour. <laughs> it's a long time to talk, especially after I've been doing podcasting all week too, my voices going to be gone by the end of this week. <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, leading the session today. You were amazing and I learned a lot of new things about herbs. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I am putting your email in the chat now. So thank you. everyone should have that. Um, we've had a few questions in chat as well as some questions in the q a so let me go to the chat first um you answered the question about the containers earlier yeah um i believe michael x my indian hawthorn has a full covering a mundo growing around the base um where is the question i just lost it so mundo growing around the base of the plant plus less than six hours of sun. I removed the tree to increase sun exposure. Can I leave the mundo around the base? I would remove it. Um, I, that's just my off the top of my head suggestion. But yeah, I would remove that. And, and that kind of brings me to a, a thing I wanted to mention about companion planting. Herbs do great with vegetables so intermixing some of those in your in your area is usually good it's a good thing to do but yeah you just want to make sure it's the right companion plant diane said i can grow almost everything well except rosemary i've tried several different types what will help well i don't know what you've tried but um usually buying from a local supply going to local nurseries they'll have the ones that do well in your area that's just a good rule of thumb um so that's where i would start making sure that you're getting varieties that are sold nearby and trial and error is the way to go um i mean that's felling is the best way to learn so that's what i at least tell myself <laughs> 
Teresa said bay leaves are good for tea. Is that the same as basil? Bay leaves? Yeah. Bay leaves are their own. If I'm understanding the question, bay leaves are their own thing. And they are good to mix into like, I wouldn't use many, but if you're making a stock or stew or soup, those are great to put one or two in because they're very strong. They yeah. can get super spicy. Um, so those are great for a couple and basil is its own thing. Uh, so you can use a lot more basil than you can bay leaf. Yeah, if, I, use, if I, understand. I use bay leaves in like my roast and basil more so I, I think about like Italian food mm -hmm. and pizza. Yep. <laughs> Okay, Liz says, is cilantro cold hardy here? Yes. Um, Hannah wants to know, is bronze fennel the same as the fennel you showed? Yes, I think, if I remember what I showed, but I think so. Okay. Um, JB wants to know how to test soil. And I know we have kits here on site. Yes, um, so you will not necessarily need a kit, but you send in, I mean, they're great because they have little instructions on the side, but what I tell most people, if, especially if they're in a rural area and not nearby somewhere where they can pick them up, like in the, which every county has an extension office. So, and we keep them fully stocked with the little boxes and print out of where to send it, how to send in your $7. But what I tell people is just put a little baggie. You don't need much. We don't need your whole yard. <laughs> it just takes a little bit of the soil to test. And you can send that into Auburn Soil Lab. And you can find that online by looking up um, just like Auburn's Soil Lab. I think it's in the Alpha building here on campus. And it has the full address there on, on our website. And you can send that in and you will usually receive results in three to seven days is the average and the goal um, and you can give them an email address where you want your results sent to and you can mail in a check with your soul sample or pay online okay. what's the difference between a dandelion and a false dandelion i don't know <laughs> um Lemongrass suggestions for containers. Um, I mean, whatever the store has, lemongrass doesn't come in too terribly many varieties, but whatever they have is going to do great. Lemongrass is a good one. And it keeps the mosquitoes away too, I've heard. <laughs> okay, Teresa said, thank you. I tried growing cilantro and it did not do well. Now I know why. Um, nursery suggestions in Birmingham. So I don't want to get in trouble by leaving anyone out, but my personal favorite is sweet peas and homewood. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're great. They're local. They have really informed people that work there and that own it. Um, I really always have a great time going there. And of course, leaf and petal and petals from the past if you're doing fruit trees uh dr parnell is everything ever know about fruit so those are my top three and if you're a member of of friends of birmingham botanical gardens you get discounts at botanica dorothy mcdaniel's flower market farm stand by stone hollow houseplant collective leaf and petal at the gardens myers plants and pottery Petals from the Past, Shop Birmingham, Sweet Peas Garden Shop, and Wild Things. So that's always an added bonus of membership with us. Um, Olivia, thanks for the information, great advice, and great resources. Do you have a recommended go-to resource on culinary herbs? I bought, I bought a Cuban oregano last year at the BBG plant sale that smelled great and grew so big it tried to take over the world but I didn't cook with it how would you use it um I think when I got to oregano I mentioned a few things but just googling I mean there's millions I could talk about uses for herbs for hours um 
Google some fun recipes that utilize oregano and find what you like. Um, Cause I, I know what I like and everybody's taste is different, but that's always a good starting point for me. And I think I just got clarification on the bay leaf um, question. They were talking about bay leaves that come from trees. Are those the same as the bay leaves that we cook with? It is, yeah. Okay, so yeah. bay leaves come from trees and basil is more I, so an, yeah. Yeah, an herb. Yeah. Um, I guess they wanted to know if it was good to use in a tea or if basil was just soup. Ty, could you let us know whether you're asking if the bay leaves are good for a tea or if you can substitute basil for bay leaves in a tea? That would help. I saw a question come in just then about the Asian market in Birmingham. And if you want anything super fun, yeah, Green Springs. We have so, two. We have two. Yeah. yeah. There's Wayne's, Hannah just mentioned, but my favorite is uh, the bigger one. Oh goodness, what is it called? Oriental Supermarket, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, but it's connected to um, a grocery store next to it. But oh my goodness, they have everything. But it's not fresh. I mean, I love it. And I, I like live right by Green Springs, so I'm there all the time. But growing some of those is, you get so much more of that flavor. Mm -hmm. Um, Liz, you will have access to the presentation later. I'll be working on the follow-up email with the link to the presentation, a bibliography from our library, and a survey that we would really like y'all to fill out so that we can um, have some questions for our experts at the end of the year. Um, someone just asked about the Asian store. Lands on Green Springs. What city area? Okay, someone just asked about the Asian market again. Everybody is really interested in the Asian market. Yeah, I mean, it's a great hidden treasure. Green Springs as a whole is a hidden treasure, in my opinion. Yeah. There's also a Mediterranean market there um, yeah. next to the Domino's Pizza, if y'all didn't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, Susan said, I just bought basil plants that look great, but now they have brown spots. Should I still plant them? um you can send in there at the botanical gardens we have a plant pathology lab and you can send those in and figure out what that is yes um if you take a picture and email it to dr jacoby you might get a quicker response mm -hmm. um tammy said how can i keep my mature rosemary bush from falling over mm, stake it maybe i'm not sure the situation but you could stake it. And again, I'm commercial horticulture. So it's a very different world. Um, I just have such a love for herbs that I wanted to do this, but that's probably why I'm a little rusty on some of the questions because I work with large scale farmers is, is what I do. But so some of this I am a little rusty on. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, why were the herbs sunken in the pots instead of soil in that picture you showed? I don't know. <laughs> I know some people have been sinking pots um, to retain moisture or like people have been burying pots. The only the time I see it done is when there's, because Alabama has a lot of uh, diseases, soil, burnt, soil born diseases mm -hmm. and that you just can't get rid of. They're just there. So I see a lot of my growers put things, especially fruit um, in a container and then plant it. Um, because it, it, you know, it would prevent some of those diseases to taking over. Yeah. And Liz also just said that you could do that possibly because it keeps things like knit from right. getting out of control. Mm -hmm. um, someone said there was rosemary in one picture in a window garden. Isn't that going to get too big? I don't know. In that window. <laughs> I do I don't know if they have any miniature rosemary I have to ask hope she just did a class on like miniature yeah um, they come out things. with fun mini versions um what size containers for different herbs it depends on what you want to do um uh Pinterest has a lot of fun ideas but it, you can keep them contained by doing a smaller container and mm -hmm. 
but you know, give things ample space, of course, at the same time though, but it's not, it's whatever you really, however large you want it to get. And if you don't want something to grow outside of like a smaller pot that you have, should they just propagate when it grows to kind of keep it contained? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, we answered the dandelion versus false dandelion. How do you keep your established, well, somebody asked about the rosemary bush falling over again. And uh, <laughs> we answered sorry. the cilantro um, cold hardy. And what is the best location to plant lavender? There was a lot of mm -hmm. lavender at our plant sale two weeks ago. I think they said they had seven varieties. Yeah, it depends on which variety you get too. Um, you can, I mean, I hate to say Google, but some of that, you know, depending on which variety you got, just looking that up.